All right, so we will jump right in. So tonight we'll be talking about AAC assessment considerations in degenerative disease. And we're focusing on assessment. We also talk a little bit about intervention just because when we're dealing with degenerative conditions, there's often kind of ongoing assessment intervention kind of intermingled along the way. So our learning objectives for tonight are all listed here. Um, I will say we have a whole bunch of stuff to cover. Uh, so we'll try to keep, keep it moving, keep moving through. Um, we recognize this is a pretty big topic. So um, we want to give sort of an overview of what AAC assessments can look like with folks who have these conditions um, and sort of we want to leave you with practical strategies and considerations for working with this population, um, kind of moving forward. So first of all, I just wanna give an overview of what neurodegenerative diseases are and some general considerations you may wanna have across different populations. So when working with patients or clients who have any type of degenerative condition. We'll move on a little bit later to talk about um, some condition-specific cons considerations, um, particularly with regard to ALS. And um, we'll also talk about multiple sclerosis a little bit as well. But a brief overview of neurodegenerative conditions. So there are two kind of main types of these degenerative conditions. We have our acquired physical impairments, so those are going to be the primary focus of this presentation. And these are impairments that result from neurologic disease that ultimately affect movement and they cause motor speech disorders. So they cause changes specifically in the motor ability to produce speech. Examples of these conditions include ALS, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, hereditary ataxias, multi-system atrophy, and Huntington's disease. Um, and there are certainly more that aren't listed that are probably more rare, but these are some of the common conditions we see when working with adults who need AAC. Um, just including it here, there are also acquired degenerative cognitive communication impairments. So these are conditions that progressively interfere with learning, memory, communication, and other cognitive functions. Examples of these conditions include Alzheimer's disease, and other forms of dementia, as well as primary progressive aphasia. Those populations, that's a whole, a whole nother presentation. It would be too much to cover all at once tonight. So we're focusing primarily again on those degenerative motor impairments. So my father and grandmother had dementia and Alzheimer's at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Chris. That's, um, yeah, well. yeah, those conditions can definitely have big impacts on communication and AAC yes, can, can. Be, can be very beneficial um, for folks who are dealing with dementia and Alzheimer's. We're not going to focus on it tonight, but it's definitely worth, worth mentioning. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so, some overarching considerations for degenerative disease. When you're working with someone who has a de degenerative condition, they're beginning to experience a progressive loss of function across different body systems. So someone who has a degenerative motor condition will start to experience changes in their ability to move their body. So their hands, their feet, their arms, um, they can experience changes in eye movements. So they can experience nystagmus or that kind of shaky vision. Um, they, it can be more difficult to move their eyes um, or they can just experience general visual changes. We also see changes of course in speech and the ability to um, quickly and effectively and clearly speak. And then folks will also experience changes in their breathing and their respiratory support over time. We can also see changes in language, cognition, and behavior in these conditions. Um, they're not so as much of a hallmark as they are, for example, in someone who has a dementia-like process. Um, but we do wanna consider that conditions such as Parkinson's, for example, multiple sclerosis, ALS, 
can have some impact on cognition and behavior as well. So that's something we wanna keep in mind. Um, all of these factors have implications for AAC access, positioning needs, and the need for communication partner support over time. Um, so for example, if someone's losing their ability to move their hands and arms, they won't be able to directly press buttons on a device, on a speech generating device. Um, but perhaps they can use another modality such as eye gaze or head pointing. Um, with another lens, if someone's having trouble with eye movements and vision, that's going to impact a lot of our AAC decisions. Um, so we may need to consider modalities such as auditory scanning, um, partner assisted strategies, things of that nature. When working with these populations, there's very much a heavy focus on counseling and shared decision making. Um, many patients and families experience grief because they're coping with this new loss of function. Um, these are people who have been speaking and communicating their whole lives, and now they're faced with a dramatic change. And for some, they may be experiencing, you know, they're, they're expecting a very sudden and dramatic decline, depending on the condition that they have. So there's often a lot of grief and emotions and processing that comes in working with this population. So we really heavily focus on partnering with patients, with families, and with other professionals um, to address those emotions and beliefs and thought process, processes that go along with these conditions. Um, other things that are important to consider that we'll continue to talk about are the timing of AAC evaluation and intervention. And then of course, how do we go about selecting um, and funding an AAC system when we're expe expecting a functional decline. When the person in front of us, maybe they haven't declined severely yet, but we see that that decline is starting to occur. Briefly, I wanted to touch on this model. So this is just a model of sort of um, clinical practice and also practice and research when it comes to functioning disability and health. So um, the World Health Organization put out their international classification of functioning disability and health many years ago. Um, really this model is just meant to provide a standard language and framework for describing health and functioning. The important thing I want to touch on here is that neurodegenerative disease doesn't only cause the physical impairments that we're talking about. It, can, it also impacts you know, the activities that someone does in their day-to-day -day lives, and it can impact their ability to participate in meaningful, so, meaningful social roles. So it can change the way they interact in their families, can impact employment, education, community involvement, those kinds of areas. Um, but the good thing for us is that AAC and assistive technology has come a long way, and there are many ways that we can support participation in those social roles through intervention. And then lastly, of course, this model also considers environmental and personal factors, which may impact someone's condition and their experience of disability. So um, components of the environment, for example, can serve as facilitators or barriers to intervention and the progress that we're making in therapy. Um, we can definitely you know, some people may really embrace what we're doing right away. Some may have a lot of difficulty with that. Um, there can be barriers based on uh, like family and community relationships, or if someone has really great social support, those can be great facilitators um, to support communication. Now I included this video, I'm gonna play this really quickly. Um, this is a video from Toby Dynafox of a gentleman named Steve um, sharing about his AAC uh, device and his experiences. And I included this video specifically just because he touches a lot on those sort of um, social roles and life participation. And it's just a nice video, so. Mm -hmm.
Caitlin, can you stop the video for one minute? We we lost sound on our end. Hello. Yeah. Um, we had it and then we lost it. Oh. Let's see. Is it back? No. I can leave Zoom maybe and just play it in the browser. Just a moment. Let's see. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment and I'll pull it up in the browser here. Hopefully it uh, wants to cooperate. Was that true for everybody else too? Yeah. It was true. Yeah, for me too. Thank you. It's a really neat video, so I'm glad you're sharing it, uh, Caitlin. I really enjoyed seeing this earlier. Yeah. Is it coming through now? Yes. I am 33 years old and of hemotoneurin disease for two half years. I live in Sheffield with my wife, Sarah, and two sons, Charlie and Maxwell. I have been unable to use my fingers to type since around November 2013. I have used the eye gaze system since then. The communication software has been the biggest improvement. It is quite slick and fast. The dwell free keyboard is so quick, I find I have to really know what I want to say. It is sometimes quicker than my mind. The device has been integral in helping me remain in work. Also, I have set up a micro worry. We have made around 15 brews so far. I was even able to design a logo and pump clips. I don't think you can underestimate the effects that being able to communicate can have. It is critically important for me to be able to communicate with my sons. Flash Daddy can turn the cartoons on which they appreciate. It is so important to my family that I am able to communicate with my sons and wife. It has made a massive difference to our lives. You don't have to live without a voice. So it's a nice video. Let me get this coming here. Okay. All right. Can you guys see the slides again? Okay. Awesome. Um, so just a nice video. Again, he's, I really like that video because Steve, you know, he's talking about his role as a father, as a husband, being able to communicate with his family. He's still working. Um, it's pretty cool what AAC and assistive technology can do. Um, so now continuing on with just general considerations in degenerative disease. Um, so we'll talk a little, we'll talk more about assessment considerations a little bit later, um, but some general things to keep in mind. Um, we want to see a timely referral for AAC assessment. This is particularly true if we're working with someone who we know has a more rapidly progressive condition. Um, ALS, for example, progresses fairly quickly um, for many individuals. So um, we do want to get someone in to see an SLP really quickly, just for an overall assessment when they are diagnosed with a degenerative condition that we know can affect speech. Um, but when it comes to the AAC assessment, you can sometimes refer to early. So if someone's not showing um, massive functional changes yet, maybe they've started with, they have relatively mild symptoms right now. Um, it's very possible that if you try to assess and get a device very quickly and get other supports quickly, 
that you could end up choosing a system that maybe doesn't turn out to be the best fit for the person. So you do want to get AAC assessment moving early on, but just kind of be mindful that you may not know exactly how a condition is going to progress moving forward. Um, that's especially true with conditions like multiple sclerosis, for example. It's highly variable from one person to the next. Um, or with ALS, some people see symptoms like fairly isolated to their arms and legs early on, whereas others show early changes in speech. Um, so kind of the selections you make can definitely be um, it's possible you could make selections that aren't quite the right fit if you move too early. Um, but I would still argue that a little early is definitely better than too late in the process because you have a lot more options if you get in the door early and start talking about what options there are. Um, during your assessment, you wanna identify those participation patterns and communication needs that someone has, what social roles are they engaged in, what's meaningful to them, you want to assess current and anticipated capabilities. So um, we're looking at motor capabilities, cognitive function, speech and language, and then other sensory capabilities like vision and hearing. You want to assess potential constraints affecting AAC decisions. So those include things such as social support, attitudes and beliefs, someone's just initial kind of acceptance of their condition and of the need for potential assistive technology, and then also um, funding and insurance as well. And then of course, after that, along with all of that stuff, you're going to trial and select different AAC devices and systems. Um, Sarah, I see your comment. Um, I did not send out the PowerPoint, but I can definitely share the slides with you. I can send Adam in the chat at, um, maybe when Kristen's presenting here shortly. All right. So I just really like this quote. Um, this is from John Costello, who's an SLP working out of Boston Children's Hospital. He's the director of the, um, the AAC program there, as well as they actually have even though it's Boston Children's Hospital, they have an ALS AAC program that is um, really phenomenal. He says, we can't change someone's medical diagnosis, but we can support people to maintain dignity, control, and social connectedness while expressing their true selves and remaining active members of the world around them. And that's really our goal here. Our goal isn't to, you know, get a patient and family to agree to use some device that we think is the best fit for them based on our clinical experience or expertise. We want to work with them based on what their goals are to help them um, maintain, again, dignity, social connectedness as they move forward in their lives. One very, like I mentioned before, one critical component of working in degenerative conditions is counseling. Um, ASHA defines the role of SLP in counseling as including interactions related to emotional reactions, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that result from living with the communication disorder. Um, I included this quote here from um, a book that is all about counseling for SLPs. Um, SLPs often feel uncomfortable about the counseling role and consequently tend to avoid it. This occurs even though most of the counseling opportunities relate to coping with lives that have been changed by a communication disorder, not to psychopathology. Um, it's, it's difficult to sit with difficult emotions and just listen and be and offer support. Um, we have a tendency to really try to educate, right? And provide information in the hopes that that will help. And sometimes that's not always the best the best fit or the best approach, and certainly not the only approach. Providing good counseling to our patients can improve the therapeutic relationship, decrease feelings of isolation, promote acceptance and change, empower patients and families, and ultimately support AAC acceptance and use. Um, now, we do not have the time to go into all the counseling theories and strategies, but I've included some resources uh, here and on the next slide of just um, some approaches that may be helpful. So just a few counseling theories listed there on the bottom. And then some counseling techniques on this slide. Um, this touches on how 
we often provide a lot of content counseling or a lot of education. So, you know, this demonstrates our expertise. It shows that we're credible. We know what we're talking about. And for some patients and families, and at certain times, it can decrease feelings of powerlessness and it can be received very well, but we can also definitely cause information overload. And when someone's already dealing with, you know, grief and a lot of challenging emotions, that can be too much and can sometimes increase the confusion and sort of be a barrier in the process. So I really argue for, you know, providing plenty of affect counseling. So addressing those emotions, allowing those emotions to come forward, listening, empathizing, um, those sorts of things. And then I included um, a link to a website all about motivational interviewing, which is a really great uh, counseling technique that I enjoy using in practice. Um, again, not getting into the nitty gritty, but um, resources, there's that resource. And then in the references, there's some things that may be helpful. I'm going to pass it over to Kristen. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, great. Uh, so counseling just in general, I think this is a huge part of working with any population, but specifically the adult population with any kind of acquired difficulties that we're dealing with. Um, so one thing that that I I kind of focus on and focusing on in general would be building a partnership with your patient rather than acting like you are the expert or the end all be all. Um, you want to find out what the patient's goals are, not what your goals are for them. Although we are experts in the area of communication disorders, we are not experts for this patient. So I often approach it with. Um, that we're in this journey together and they're allowing me to be a part of it and a partnership. So how can I help you with my toolbox coming along on this journey? What is that going to um, provide for you? So uh, meeting the patient where they are while planning for the future, specifically with patients that have ALS, we know that it's something that is quickly moving, that it is something that we're always kind of going to need to be planning for the future. So talking about um, where they are with those emotions um, and grief, anticipating that there is a future loss in function, um, listening to them, reflecting back and like pl planning together. It's like, what is this journey going to look like? The patient is always the one that is in control. Um, and we offer support and resources, resources in our area, resources for funding. What else can we do? Um, to support them and their goals. So um, what about buy-in? So uh, buy-in in general, I think is huge for therapy, uh, getting that buy-in in the evaluation, kind of uh, talking with the patient, having that rapport building, but like resistance to AAC is pretty common. Like if I told you, you weren't able to talk anymore um, with speech in a, in a natural way, it's something that's really daunting for most people. Uh, so how do we start that conversation? I think that, you know, jumping right in with a high tech um, devices can be overwhelming for someone. So kind of starting small and having that patient and family see the benefit of simple things, simple supports, giving them a little little taste of what AAC or what supportive devices can provide for them. Um, not focusing solely on impairments, but how can they participate more? A lot of our patients are um, really not communicating. They kind of start to sit back. It's harder to communicate. They're not being understood. Uh, how are we getting them back into communication and feeling empowered again? How do we empower them um, to want to communicate? Uh, trialing devices, a lot of different uh, device, uh, a lot of different companies will let you trial for like 30 days or more. Um, and you really want to involve family and caregiver and try to make it fun and individual um, in order to get buy-in. You know, I tend to be funny and loud and I'm from Boston and part of that is my shtick or my therapy shtick, but um, my patients definitely find that humor. Like, how can you make something funny? How can you tell someone, no, I don't want to do my therapy exercises today? Um, 
all of those things are a way to kind of get them to buy in that this will actually be positive and not like I have to use this computer in order to talk for me. That's not what it's about. It's about being assistive, being augmentative to communication. We're still working on speech. That's still the goal, even with people um, who are really difficult to understand. What can they say? What can we do um, with those patients? So that's how I deal with it. So um, multimodal communication. So kind of what I was starting to talk about a little bit was just motor speech intervention. We want to preserve speech. It's the most natural, least restrictive way to communicate. That's how we all communicate, how we would prefer to communicate. Um, but what can we do to use speech as well as other kind of assistive devices, whether that be voice amplification for patients that have lower volume or decreased respiratory control, um, lower tech communication boards, flip books, or wallet cards. That's a quick buy-in device, like giving them something to kind of participate. Um, letter or topic queuing to help with intelligibility, being understood. What are we talking about? It allows people to better understand um, what that patient is trying to say. Uh, and we can use different things like partner assisted scanning or spelling. So there's many different ways to support kind of multimodal communication. Great. And then partner training. Um, having partners involved with uh, AAC is huge, as we all know. I think with therapy in general, um, at least in my the adult outpatient population I'm working with now, uh, so communication interactions are impacted by the person with the disorder as well as their communication partners. So having partner training, having buy-in, not just with your patient, but also with um, their partner, their communication is, is huge. It impacts um, their ability to have self-esteem and dignity. Um, increasing the need for communication partner support is anticipated over disease progression. So the more the disease progresses, the more we need support from our partner, whether that's to set up the device or to change things or to use different devices throughout um, the day or week or whatever. Um, I don't remember what this one is, Caitlin, the hear people. Tell me more about that one. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's a link. Um, the reason it's underlined like that is because it's a link. So again, happy to, I'll send all the slides out so everyone can access all the resources included. Um, boss, this is, uh, from the ALS center at Boston Thank Children's you. Hospital. Um, they have this page with videos all from AAC users and they're just giving their perspective on what it's like when communication partners try to predict what they're saying when people are reading over their shoulder on their device instead of waiting for them to actually say it. Um, they're just giving kind of their perspectives on those interactions with communication partners. Um, so it's just, you know, we can't watch all those videos right now, but it's a really great resource and it's nice to hear those perspectives. Um, some of the things, you know, that the people say are, um, for example, like if it's someone they're really familiar with, like a spouse, that's that's more acceptable to them, right? Um, whereas if they're communicating with someone new and the person's reading over their shoulder and trying to predict it, it can be really frustrating. And, you know, it can feel really disrespectful and intrusive because they're trying to put their message together um, and someone else is, you know, they're trying to help, but it's, it's not helping. It's not what natural communication feels like. So um, just a really great kind of selection of videos there to get some perspectives from AAC users. Which I, I think is great too, like giving support to not just the grief of the patient, but also the grief of the partner, right? Like they're, they've lost a lot of that communication with their partner um, and they're trying to help, but oftentimes they're helping and, and not not the best ways. So, so doing like that counseling piece, um, not just for the patient, but also for the partner um, is what I got out of those videos. Now that you reminded me what the hyperlink was. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I don't remember this hyperlink. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, cool. 
<laughs> no problem. <clears throat> All right. Um, and this slide, this is just meant to be kind of a reference with a list of a few companies to consider that have high tech devices with alternate access methods um, and, ooh, and <laughs> software um, that is appropriate for adults. This isn't an all-inclusive list by any means. I also included a link to NWAC's resource about AAC and assistive tech companies, because there's a lot more resources there um, as far as com uh, companies that not only offer devices, but also that offer mounts or switches and other kinds of accessories and um, materials. Okay, so now we are going to get into condition specific considerations. Um, we're specifically going to focus pretty heavily on ALS um, because it's a population that there's a lot of research on and that benefits so much from AAC because of the fairly rapidly progressive nature of the condition. Um, and then we'll touch on multiple sclerosis as well. And then after that, we're going to get into a bit about documentation and funding. So I'm gonna keep this fairly brief, but if you're not familiar with ALS or need a refresher, it's a degenerative condition that impacts motor neurons of the brain and spinal cord. Um, the prevalence is about five per 100,000 people in the US with a mean age of onset of 56 years. So still, you know, fairly a fairly young population. Um, prognosis, the mean survival time is about two to five years from symptom onset. Um, there have been cases where folks have lived a bit longer than that, but overall, um, the life expectancy is fairly short once um, symptoms have started. And that's why that, you know, getting AAC started early is so important. Initial symptoms typically include weakness, uh, most commonly of the arms or legs, but sometimes people present initially with speech and swallowing disturbances and respiratory weakness. Um, and sometimes too, you get a mixed onset where someone kind of gets symptoms across the board um, all at once. Approximately 80 to 95% of people with ALS will be unable to speak by the time of their deaths. So again, getting AAC in the door and having a system that can adapt as their disease progresses is really critical. And yeah, that's what that last bullet point says. <laughs> <laughs> Um, communication impairments in ALS, um, predominantly what we're going to see is a motor speech disorder. So uh, this presents as a mixed flaccid spastic dysarthria for all the, the speech therapists here. Um, so we see upper and lower motor neuron symptoms, and then respiratory weakness often emerges over the course of the disease. We can sometimes see changes in um, cognition and behavior in ALS um, about 6.5% experience a dementia type process and about 4% experience mild cognitive impairment. Um, and then about 30% will experience changes in behavior, which can manifest as apathy, irritability, inflexibility, poor frustration tolerance, or emotional indifference. These factors don't preclude AAC, um, but they can definitely impact some evaluation and treatment decisions. And they can impact, you know, the individual's acceptance, learning, and use of an AAC system. We don't typically see language impairments with ALS like aphasia. Um, so typically language function is, is well preserved. I included this slide. This is a study from Ball and colleagues from 2004, where they were looking at AAC acceptance in people with ALS. Um, in their study, 90% of participants immediately accepted AAC. They understood their condition, the prognosis, and they were on board like, okay, let's, let's do what we've got to do. 6% accepted AAC, but after a delay. So they weren't open to it immediately, but they got there. And then there were only 4% who fully rejected AAC. And these patients all were exhibiting um, co-occurring dementia, cognitive behavioral changes. None of the participants who used AAC ever discontinued their use of AAC. They all continued using it um, over the course of their condition. One thing to note is that many no longer used their speech generating devices within their last few months of life. 
Um, but they still use AAC in the form of like partner assisted communication strategies. The primary themes that emerge as far as delayed acceptance goes, people would say things like, I can understand everything I need to, um, or fa family members would say, I can understand what they're saying. I can understand them fine. I can take care of what they need. We don't need to do this. Um, there was some resistance from physicians, which is a bit concerning. This is from 2004. I'm hoping that maybe attitudes are, have just improved further with time and with more awareness of ALS. Um, but some physicians have kind of said, well, this is it. There's nothing we can do. And then sometimes the person with ALS will have, won't really have accepted their condition yet. So they'll, they'll say, I'm not disabled. My speech is fine. It's going to stay fine. I, I don't need this. Ultimately, people who were, you know, saying those things, these kinds of themes that emerged, um, they eventually did accept AAC, um, but maybe it was a bit later as they were experiencing a decline in their speech. Again, those cognitive limitations were seen as the primary factor that led to rejection of AAC. Um, so that wasn't something that commonly occurred with this specific population. I'm seeing denial to Caitlin, just to, to jump in for a second. Like I was just thinking back to some of the ALS patients I have seen. I've seen, un unfortunately, quite a few recently. Um, I had two, one was completely rejecting it. Like I'm not disabled at all. And her speech was severely impaired already. Right. So that counseling piece too, but maybe some cognitive impairment, but um, I had a couple other ones similar. It's just that, that other counseling piece, like that, like, okay, we don't have to do that right now. Like, what are you willing to try? Um, so I'm, I'm not super surprised by this. Um, the physician one I really hope has changed though. Like, we'll just keep working on that one. Right. <laughs> I, I haven't seen any like newer articles on this topic. So no. this is a little old, but um, still there could very well be physicians out there with that kind of a mindset. Um, yes. But I think awareness of ALS and advocacy has improved so much over the years um, that those attitudes have probably improved <laughs> and certainly aren't far reaching at this point. Um, let's see. So now... Um, We'll talk, we'll get into the kind of some of the nitty gritty as far as AAC assessment and intervention with this population. Um, we're following sort of this three phase intervention model from Ball and colleagues. Um, we can sort of approach AAC evaluation and intervention in these three phases. So in the early phase, that's just the time between someone's ALS diagnosis and their referral for an AAC assessment. The middle phase is the time period between that AAC referral and the selection, purchase, and implementation of the device. And then the late phase is where you're adapting and accommodating as the person's condition progresses over the course of their lifespan. In the early stages, so what we kind of wanna see is that if someone gets an ALS diagnosis, they should get a speech therapy referral because we know how this disease progresses. We know, we know what it looks like. That doesn't necessarily mean that the AAC evaluation for a speech generating device happens immediately. But what we do want to do right away is start monitoring motor speech function. So um, Ball and colleagues, again, 2002, um, they found, they gave this lovely graphic um, and they showed that we can monitor speak, speaking rate sort of as a proxy for sort of a, that initial decline in speech function. So speech rate in ALS typically declines before intelligibility starts to decline. But once speaking rate kind of gets to a certain threshold, we see this very sharp decline in intelligibility pretty, pretty suddenly, pretty quickly. Um, so if we're using objective measures and looking at speaking rate over time, we start to see that decline and we see that speaking rate gets below this threshold of about 125 words per minute we should definitely refer for an AAC assessment. Um, this benchmark is actually great. You can use this in report writing as, um, oh gosh, to help with your rationale for like why this person needs to get funding for this device now, because we know that this drop off in speaking rate is associated with a soon to come drop off in speech intelligibility. 
The other thing is if someone comes to you and they already have dysarthria symptoms, if their intelligibility is below 90%, even if they're speaking quickly, get that AAC referral started because that intelligibility has already started to decline. Also during this early phase, so along with monitoring of motor speech function, um, this is a good time to start screening cognitive and behavioral function. Um, we have, there is this tool, the ALS Cognitive Behavioral Scale. So it's specifically designed for the ALS population. Um, it's free, it's online. So it's a real, that's a really great tool to use. Um, during this time, you wanna support AAC options. So talk about things such as voice banking and message banking. Those are time intensive processes that you want to do while the person has pretty good speech function. Um, if that's an avenue they want to pursue. So you want to talk about that early on, even if you haven't assessed for a specific device yet. Um, again, we wanna make that timely referral for an AAC assessment or initiate an AAC assessment if you're the one completing it. And then of course, you can always begin implementing sort of light tech uh, AAC supports and work on natural speech strategies. Um, you can always try things like voice amplifications, uh, text-to-speech, things of that nature kind of in this phase. And then there's lots of, again, education and counseling with the patient and with their family and caregivers. Um, if you're not familiar with voice and message banking, Voice banking is the process of recording one's voice, um, recording one's speech to create a synthetic voice that sort of approximates their natural voice. So this allows the person to produce novel messages over time using a speech generating device, and it uses a voice that sounds a lot like theirs. The thing about voice banking is it requires about four to six hours, sometimes more of recording time. And in someone who has ALS, they'll be experiencing fatigue, it can be a very time consuming process. Message banking on the other hand is the process of recording specific personally selected messages in your own voice. So it's your own voice, your own inflection, your own tone, and then uploading those to a device to be played at a later time. Um, so the difference with that, those are all just pre-stored messages as opposed to a synthesized voice that could produce any novel utterance over time. And there's this fun new um, approach called double dipping where um, there's actually the ability now to use your message banked messages. So if you do message banking to start, um, you can use those to create a synthetic voice with acapella at a later time. Um, this is something that by my understanding is pretty new. I only learned about it recently. Um, I learned it about it today. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin told me about it. It's so cool. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's, um, but it's a really cool process and there's not a lot of information out there about it, but nice. um, it's something that's new where if you've done a sufficient amount of message banking, that can be your input to create a synthetic voice with acapella. Um, so pretty cool what we can do. Um, these are, again, this is more just for reference. There's lots of different voice and message banking platforms available. Um, I did wanna highlight the, the last bullet, the My Message Banking from uh, Boston Children's Hospital and Toby Dynavox. That is a free open access message banking service. Um, so it is completely free to create an account, to bank your messages, and to download them for personal use. Um, again, it's a joint effort from Boston Children's and Toby Dynavox. And you can use those, you know, the messages banked on that free service to later use with um, acapella, which it would be paid. All right. And I'm going to pass it on to Kristen. I think it's amazing. Thank you, Caitlin. I was going to say, um, you know, one of the big things, at least, uh, you know, in the early stage, just to add to what Caitlin was just saying, when we get patients early in disease, oftentimes they're not diagnosed with that ALS diagnosis. They'll say suspected or they're waiting, you know, especially in the time post-COVID 
Um, medical appointments are a little harder to get. I'm sure everybody's experienced that. Um, so getting a diagnosis is harder. So having a free message banking that they could start doing in that earlier phase, hey, why don't we just like start um, putting those messages into this uh, system that's free. We're not asking them to get uh, into acapella, which then has a cost. And the Gleason Foundation um, is amazing in supporting an uh, acapella login and because it is a, there's a cost to it, but having this free message banking to me was amazing. And it's from Boston Children's and they're amazing. So anyway, so that was my side note there, but um, so middle to late phases. So middle phase um, is where we're in, in the point of assessing, recommending and implementing devices. Um, the time period from a AAC referral through selection, purchase, initial instructions. So this is kind of the meat of where we're identifying what devices we're using, what devices are going to be um, able to move with us as this diagnosis shifts the patient's abilities. So there's a lot of AAC devices out there that are very very good at what they do, but it's stagnant. So we often need something that is a little bit more dynamic in terms of access and all of that. So identifying um, participation patterns and communication needs of this particular patient, um, <laughs> assessing current and anticipated capabilities. Um, so their motor capabilities, how are they gonna access this right now? And how, what, what are we expecting? them to be able to access it later for like things like, um, are they wheelchair bound at this time? We know eventually they will be um, confined to a wheelchair or bed. How are they gonna access this device, whether um, through touch or through um, vision, their cognition, speech and language, visual and hearing. So we're looking through all of those as we're assessing. Um, and then also trying to look to the future as to if they were, uh, which is always hard, uh, what what is their fatigue level and how are they um, going to use this? So selecting high and low tech AAC options, um, kind of looking at at different things that uh, they can use. Things like the the Toby Dynavox is is something that I use a, a lot because it is dynamic and something that I can kind of uh, that grows with the patient. Um, low tech options like. Um, as simple as an alphabet board or letter options, or um, even just a small choice board, things like that. So different um, options for them. And then we're providing facilitator support. So supporting um, not only learning of the patient, but also learning of the uh, facilitators or, or the partners. Um, in, the, in the later phases of ALS, uh, we're looking at people that uh, I worked for a while. I worked in lots of different places in 20 years, but I worked for a while in a in an LTAC, uh, so a long-term acute care hospital with trach invented patients. And one of my patients was um, a patient with ALS who um, was diagnosed at the age of 40. Uh, and she uh, passed when she was 50. When I was working with her, she was about 48, so eight years post-diagnosis. Um, she was completely immobile with the exception of eyebrow movement. So we utilized eyebrow movement to access her device. So she um, was able to do eye gaze at times. Other times we had, what is that thing called again? The mouse, the forehead mouse, Caitlin? The, the head pointing with like the little- Thank you, for, with the forehead mouse. Uh, yeah. And then we used a letter board with partner assisted communication. Uh, but she was able to communicate fantastically. She wrote me an email every single day. I was telling Caitlin she accessed her environment just fine um, with lots of different things. So even when she's ventilated, unable to move any extremity, unable to move her mouth, even um, unable to breathe, she was still able to communicate, which I thought was huge. Um, but the AAC modify like what you modify based on what your patient needs, right? What are their physical capabilities? Where are they living? Are they living at home? Are they living in an LTAC? Are they hospital bound? Um, we have a lot of uh, ventilated patients that are in this stage. There's lots of wires and different um, access. So you're working not only yourself, but also with PT and OT on how is this patient accessing their environment? Um, how can we work together to do that? So what am I missing, Caitlin? No, good. Okay. <laughs> no, I think I think you got it all. The main thing good. is our AAC system needs to be able to adapt over time. Um, 
So we want to consider that that multimodal communication. Um, if your device can um, support multiple access methods, those kinds of things, um, mounting options, all that stuff is just important to consider throughout the process. Um, this slide is just more references, um, more resources. So again, we'll send the slides out um, or post them to the website. Um, and then this slide is in here um, with a little information just about the Team Gleason Foundation. Um, this is a great foundation. They support, um, they provide like funding for AAC devices, assistive technology. Um, they do lots of really cool things for ALS. Um, yes. Steve Gleason, he was a player for the New Orleans Saints. He was a football player who developed ALS. And his he and his wife created this foundation um, to support people with ALS in accessing, you know, cutting edge technology, living meaningful lives. Um, so this is a really great resource if you do have a patient with ALS, if you're needing like funding options, um, those sorts of things. Okay, I realized how we're doing on time. So um, I'm gonna give you the spark notes here. Only had a couple slides on multiple sclerosis. Um, this is a condition that's just um, very interesting and quite variable from one patient to the next. So I wanted to include a couple slides on it. Um, a lot of people with multiple sclerosis may never need AAC, but some people do develop pretty significant changes in their speech. Um, and the thing with multiple sclerosis, it's a demyelinating disease that can affect any region of the nervous system. Um, many people experience profound changes in visual function, um, as well as motor function, speech function. So that can really inhibit access to a lot of AAC technology that we're, that we're frequently using. All right, um, I'm gonna skip a couple things just because we're short on time, but it's all in the slides here. Um, so again, looking at that kind of three phase model that we looked at with ALS, um, you know, early on in the course of multiple sclerosis, when it comes to assistive technology, you may be just looking at things like screen readers, memory and organizational, organizational supports due to changes in cognitive function, using accessibility features on someone's devices they already have. Um, oftentimes those kinds of supports can be sufficient to kind of address the early impairments in multiple sclerosis. Over time, um, someone may need additional supports. And as I mentioned, um, you can definitely, it can definitely be tricky to establish like AAC access with this population because of the types of impairments we can see. So um, many, um, many people with MS will experience profound changes in their vision. So you things you might consider are using high contrast symbols on a device, larger icons and fonts. Um, some patients may use eye patching to reduce double vision or prism glasses. Um, so there's also, there are some cool kind of interventions out there. Um, you can have, uh, you can use like screen covers to reduce glare, but at some point, you know, you may want to consider modalities such as auditory scanning systems that don't rely anymore on that visual system if it's becoming severely impaired over time. Um, there's some more considerations here. We want to get to our last few slides, but this is all here for review if you're interested. And I know we are short on time, but um, Kristen, if you want to kind of jump in on this section and oh, at least sure. get the, the big points related to documentation, insurance, and funding. Yeah, that's that's an easy one. Okay, so <laughs> so high tech devices equipment is uh, they're mostly paid for by insurance uh, as long as we can show medical necessity um, of a moderate to severe impairment. Um, so in those earlier stages of ALS, we know that we, we can't necessarily qualify, um, but we know that they will qualify moving forward. So I loved Caitlin's um, slide about uh, speech rate and utilizing that to show that crippling fatigue, that over time, this patient has gone from this to this, we're showing that they have this, this condition um, and how, how we can do that. So I, I often use the modified fatigue index scale 
uh, which you ask them to fill it out at, at, if you are at your most tired, because we only see them for a snapshot in time. Um, so we see them for, you know, an hour a day, but what happens as they go through the day? So fill it out as if it was the worst. Um, I love the clip, cri crippling fatigue as well. So that, that terminology is big and insurance loves it as well. Or the communication participation item bank um, is another way for a patient reported qualification to show um, that, that crippling fatigue or that, that ability to, uh, to show that medical necessity as we always need to show. So Medicare or CMS guidelines, most insurances follow uh, Medicare or CMS guidelines. I know you guys are people that work with kiddos are working with Medicaid guidelines and they're, they're very similar. Um, uh, yes, Sarah, I see your question. Uh, the scale is available online, the modified fatigue index scale. It's a free a scale that you can print. I use it for a lot of my COG patients in general as well. Um, so uh, providing individuals the ability to meet their functioning or speaking needs. Um, so we have to show what is the impairment? Can you kind of show me exactly why this patient needs this device? Um, not just once it. Medicare or uh, CMS will cover a speech generating device or DME. It's considered durable medical equipment. Um, once every four years, you can get upgrades or add-ons if needed. So for example, I have a patient that I need, um, or I think I'm going to need eye gaze eventually with. They have ALS, I'm showing it. Um, that patient didn't qualify with the eye gaze on it yet because they didn't need it yet. I was able to get the device and then write for an upgrade later. Like now the patient needs it shortly and then they'll, they will pay for it um, as an add-on. So sometimes you can get those, those things. You just have to do the paperwork, which we all love. I know. <laughs> So documentation needs, um, it does require a speech language pathology evaluation and also a face-to-face -face with the physician demonstrating um, that they would benefit from this condition. Um, you have to show it, that you trialed at least three augmentative communication systems and provide rationale for why that device features that it has um, would not supplement this patient's needs? Why does it not fall within that need? Um, that So, and especially with lower cost devices, because the Toby Dynavox is more expensive or some of the other more expensive high tech um, eye gaze devices. There's a few other ones out there as well. Um, but why is a low tech device? Why is voice amplification not enough? Why is, um, you know, a, a link like a Lingraphica device, why is that not enough? Because you can't get eye gaze with Lingraphica. It's the screen's too small, they can't access. So you don't necessarily have to trial it with the patient, but that you considered it. So that's a big thing that I think people don't always know. You don't actually have to put it a Lingraphica in their hand. Oh, this didn't work. Okay, well then we try something else. But why did you not um, think that that would work? Um, Medicare typically covers about 80% of the device. The remainder is covered by other insurances or by the patient themselves. So it's copay. Um, and it can be quite expensive. Um, the Gleason Foundation is wonderful. The ALS Foundation, which we have one out here, the Evergreen Chapter, um, will support like what things can get covered. They sometimes have things in their closet. Um, that they let us borrow. Like if you have an ALS patient, it still takes a while to get an AAC device. I think most people on here know that it takes a really long time for insurance to cover it. Um, but the the ALS foundation will give you one to, to borrow um, as long as you are in the process of getting your own device. So I think that that's an amazing thing that they do. Um, yeah, so I, we talked a little bit about like you can upgrade the equipment or um, with a specific accessory. Other accessories that um, often don't get covered is wheelchair um, mounts. I often ask for a universal mount because you get two in one. Uh, so the universal mount is an over the bed uh, mount as well as um, a wheelchair mount. So it's universal, it can get moved in different places. And that's one that I really, I really like. And then you have these awesome links, which is the application and the checklist for Medicare, which I think is amazing, Caitlin. 
Yeah, the the work on AAC, I forget, I can't even remember what the RERC stands for, the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Count Collaborative something. Sure. Um, but they have some really <laughs> helpful, like assessment um, application protocols, checklists, so that you make sure when you're writing up your report that you're covering all your bases. Um, and then different like device vendor vendors also have their own report templates and your device reps will help you with the process. So they'll, um, they can help you with the wording in your reports um, and help you with the funding process on the whole, make sure you get all your ducks in a row, have all the documentation you need, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, were you done on that slide, Kristen? Oh gosh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> In insurance um, slide, next. <laughs> it's the hard stuff, right? This slide just has a few more resources for additional funding sources. So the Team Gleason Foundation mentioned earlier for ALS, the ALS Association, like Kristen mentioned, um, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation has an assistive technology program, um, the Telecommunication Equipment Distribution Program of Washington um, has some great resources, as well as the Washington State Division of Vocational Rehab. Um, and then um, I wanted to include here at the bottom, Marcy actually gave a lovely evening seminar in the past all about AAC funding. Um, I know Marcy's focus was more with children in the schools, but there were there's a lot of overlap, right? When we're dealing with like Medicare, Medicaid, insurance in general. Um, so that's a really useful resource if you want to learn a little more about funding, especially given this that, you know, we were trying to cover a whole heck of a lot <laughs> with this presentation. Five minutes, go. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's everything. I think we did it. I know we're a couple minutes over, so I do apologize for that, but we made it. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's stop recording.